thank you. Uh, <coughs> is this on? It's on. Wonderful. So I, I'm standing between you and four really amazing uh, speakers, uh, at least one of whom I have a very well-thumbed copy of her book that sits always within about arm's reach uh, of me because it's been such a tremendous influence, and that is Carlotta Perez, who will be speaking later. Uh, my name is Azim. I've been a founder of uh, a number of startup companies, and, and I now split my time between writing a newsletter and uh, uh, being an early stage investor in the next generation, hopefully, of, of companies. Uh, I don't have many answers in the five or six minutes that I'm going to be talking, but I do want to perhaps put some context about where we are uh, in the sort of course of history and where we are with, with technology. Um, the world that we live in today, which has really served many of us very well for the last couple of hundred years, has been governed by the ideas of Adam Smith and David Ricardo and J.S. Mill and John Watt and Thomas Telford um, and the technologies that they, they had at the time. And this paradigm has done us very, very well. We're, we're sort of wealthier and healthier, perhaps even wiser than we were um, a couple of hundred years ago. But something happened in the last 10 years um, that was reflected in the, what were the origins of the largest companies in the world. If you looked at the largest companies in the world uh, in, back in 2008, you would have seen firms like uh, Exxon and uh, General Electric and Johnson & Johnson, the children of the industrial age. And if you look at the largest companies in the world today, uh, they are all internet businesses, children of the information age, Alphabet, what we think of as Google, Amazon, uh, uh, Tencent, Baidu, Apple. Uh, and that switch in the last five or 10 years has been comparatively quick, but it does signify that things are not the same as they were before. As an investor in early stage technologies, um, what I have seen in, in my 25 year career is that we're at a point where I can't remember a time where technology was changing as quickly as it was. And crucially, compared to when I started in, in the business in, in the mid-90s, it's not just that there's a single technology that's advancing fast. Back then, it was computational power driven by Moore's law and silicon chips. It's that there are, across a range of very different domains, very, very rapid improvements in technical capability. And that these different domains are being glued together through software uh, and that allows us to combine them in novel ways. Now, I'll just give you some, some examples. So if we think about artificial intelligence, and London is a great place for us to talk about that because we have the sort of great success of, of, of DeepMind um, and a lot of other AI work, um, we're, we're seeing significant breakthroughs, things that looked like science fiction five or six years ago that today are commonplace. Computers can beat humans at Go, the, the, the board game. They can recognize Image it, what's in an image better than a human can. They can translate between uh, most uh, languages better than humans can. They can transcribe speech, whatever you think of your Siri or Alexa in general, better than a human can. And the pace of development uh, has been quantified by, by researchers, but, but we're talking about double-digit improvements on a monthly basis. But it's not just in the, in the AI domain, it's also in the underlying technologies, the silicon, silicon chips. Um, I was recently speaking to the CEO of a British company called Graphcore, which is bu building silicon chips. It's not a, an industry that's had a lot of new entrants in the last 30 years. And he tells me that the requests for computational power that he's getting for his customers are one million to a billion times more than the power, computational power they can currently get from traditional chip vendors. And he's stepping up to the challenge to deliver that. But if we look at other disparate areas, look at the, uh, the field of genomic sequencing, which is critical to delivering personalized medicine. When we first sequenced the human genome back in 2001, it cost more than $100 million. Some estimates say it was $3 billion. Today, we're approaching the level of about $1,000 to do that same thing. Now, if only our rental price, <laughs> rent went down at the same rate. Uh, but we, we've seen a, a, a several order of magnitude improvement in that, and we will be able to bring those technologies on stream. And then if we think about the, the, the challenges we face with our energy transition towards clean energy and, and climate change, um, just this week, 
a long-term solar contract was announced in the US at 2.155 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, unless you're an energy nerd, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but it's incredibly cheap and cheaper than other things uh, that, were, that were possible. But when I track renewable energy, the thing that I'm re uh, I find remarkable is that every year, every forecaster needs to revise their forecasts because they are far too conservative. The improvements are happening quicker than the best minds predict they are. And it's also happening in some other areas. Uh, we talked about genomic sequencing, but another interesting related area is synthetic biology, which is can we take the engineering disciplines that have created all of these amazing companies in technology and turn that actually to the manufacture of the, the core biochemistry and biology that, that makes life? And it's, we're quite far away from that being freaky, by the way, but we're making some quite good progress there. But, but in amongst all of this, that we are moving quite far away from Thomas Telford and Iron Bridge and steam power. Uh, and we're moving to a, to a place where the, the fundamental inputs into the, into the economy in this sense are very different to the ones that were in it when we came to the agreement about how to organize things. And when I say how to organize things, I mean how we choose to educate our children. I mean how we think about patents and intellectual property or how we account for the value that companies create. All of these institutions are now, in my view, up in the air because we're either going to have to renew them or rebuild them because the fundamental basis by which we, we think about value and the, the kind of companies we build and the kind of ways they interact with us uh, has changed. So when I think about technology, I think, very powerful, almost like magic in some strange way. But I also realize that it's not value neutral, that it's often built in the eyes of its creators. Its creators are people like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg at the moment, and you may feel a certain way about that. And that it's very important as we make a transition away from a sort of industrial age into an information age, that we step up individually and equip ourselves with the information to make sensible decisions, to make our views heard, to be able to participate in the formation of a new consensus because the road ahead is quite different to the road that we've just traveled. Thank you very much.